Well, blessed Friday to you as we come with your daily encouragement. And uh, the final battle here is described in Revelation 19, verse 17. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and a loud voice called out to the birds that fly in the midheaven, Come, gather for the supper of God to eat the flesh of the kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of the mighty, the flesh of the horses and their riders, the flesh of all free and slave, both small and great. And then I saw the slave. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against the rider on the horse and against his army. And the, best, the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet, who had performed in the presence signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. These two, the beast and the prophet, were thrown into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. And the rest were killed by the sword of the rider on the horse, and the sword that came from his mouth, and all the birds were gorged gorged on, the fl on with their flesh. The final judgment, at least as how it's described. Now, if you do it chronologically, we still have another time of peace and a time of war, but one might say that chapter 20 coming up is just another recapitulation of what has happened here. But let's focus on this passage here. Judgment does not come. Judgment has been delayed until the end. And the fire of judgment, you should also think about it like purification. In fact, in most ancient religions, fire was not destruction, fire was purification. Now, if we are talking about metals, and I think that this is probably a better analogy, is that when a metallurgist is forming something, whether it be, I'm thinking of like a, a horn, I played the trombone, so I'm thinking about the making of a trombone. It's made out of metal, and it involves a lot of processing of fire and pounding and, and bringing things to a purified state. We've had uh, some vessels from our altars, whether it be a cup or chalice or a cross, and many of them have been redone, and that involves a fiery process. Yes, it's judgment, but it is also purification. Now, here's the interesting thing about the fires of hell, at least as they're described in the scriptures. There's kind of a mixing of, well, is it hell or where it permanently burns, or is it a fiery process when some could be made right? Well, the understanding is, is the reason it's hell, it's because the person that goes there is constantly being purified, but they never get pure. Because as their essence, they are not fit. They're not ready. They can't get up. But the ones who have been purified in the blood of the Lamb, whose righteousness covers them, they are pure. And they get in, not by their own righteousness, but by the righteousness gifted to them by God. They've been reborn in the waters of baptism. They have received Jesus' body and blood as their righteousness. And so the presence of God doesn't burn them. It keeps them pure because they have been purified already. They don't stay in that pit. That's why it's so interesting that some of the images we have of the bosom of Abraham and Lazarus and the rich man. The rich man is in hell. He's being purified, but he can't escape. And we don't know if it's by his own choice. We There's a lot of speculation about that passage. But notice that while there's a chasm between heaven and where the rich man is, there's still some presence because God maybe desires to be with that man, and that man can't go anywhere out of the presence of God. But why is he in hell? Well, he's still being purified, and he's not getting any purer because there isn't anything to purify here. 
And so the reason I say that here is because that's where the beast and the false prophet go. To be purified, but they never get out. And you see, that's where wrath comes in. Wrath is not so much punishment as it is the reality of a person who, in a situation that can never be pure. But good news is that there is a rebirth. We believe it starts in the waters of baptism. There's a rebirth of a new heaven and a new earth. And it comes through repentance. It comes through turning. All the kings and others who are slaughtered are going into the purification process. And the question is, will they make it? Or will they turn away from the one who is trying to make them pure again? Now, I, by speculating, some might say, is there a chance that in the fires of hell you can repent enough? I'd say maybe. We're not assured of that. But what we are assured is that this purification process can either happen constantly if we turn in on ourselves, if we trust in our own righteousness, or we can exchange it, as Luther talks about, our ragged righteousness for his glorious righteousness. You see, that's the good news. He's exchanged my righteousness for his and vice versa. That's the good news. Jesus has made us pure through the blood of the Lamb exchanging his essence for ours. And that's the happy exchange that doesn't happen for the beast and for the false prophet because they're not trusting in God. They're not participating as a bride. They're not submissive to the one that they needed to be submissive to. And so that's why there's judgment. They go through that lake of fire and it doesn't purify anything because there's nothing there to purify. But why is this revealed to us? Why is this a revelation? Because we have the chance to repent. We have the chance to turn from our wicked ways. We have the chance to trust in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that will exchange, gift us with God's amazing grace. God bless you today. We trust that these continue to be words of encouragement. Take care. God bless. We'll see you next time.